<laughs> well, that's been a long time ago, yeah. Um, to, um, we have, uh, Deb, Deb said, we'll be, we leave tomorrow morning for Texas to Brother Copeland's Minister's Conference. Uh, next week, Aaron's preaching. You don't, don't want to miss that. He said it's been burning him ever since I asked him a while back and then pulled the plug on him. And he's, uh, so he's excited. And then uh, we come back, um, and it's the watershed. And I'm going to challenge him not to miss any night. <laughs> It's going to be at Pastor Mike's Church, 246 Derby Street, 7 o'clock nightly. Uh, Pastor Vicky's kicking it off on Wednesday night, um, and then uh, Pastor Marty will follow her. Thursday, it's Pastor Rob and Pastor Mark Utech. Uh, Friday, it's Pastor Mike and Pastor Chuck Tate, and then Saturday, it's Pastor Jack, and we'll, we'll cover anything he's messed up. We'll close it out. So... Uh, we get to spend time with Pastor Jack and Patty this week and next week, so pray for us. <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, we, um, we've we had church this morning already. I actually sat there for a moment and said, well, maybe I, maybe I just skip it, you know, but we're not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you what I've got, what God's given me this week. Because, you know, in, in preaching, a lot of times, as you're putting a message together, it takes time. And he just sort of said, where it's at, where it's at, where is it at, God? I've got to have it by Sunday morning. And there's been a few times in my life in ministry that it's actually didn't get until Saturday night and finished off Sunday morning. But this week I've been just sort of sitting before God and, and uh, he gave me the word. I, I don't want, I guess as I was look, looking over this this morning, what I don't want you to feel like is that I'm beating anybody up. All right. The messages should challenge us. They challenge me every time. I know that everyone that preaches, when you're putting together a message, you're hearing it first, and then you're hearing it again and again and again. And it is a challenge to us. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to take a look at this passage, maybe different than I was saying about this, and I thought, well, maybe um, some people might think I'm pulling it out of context, and I don't I don't believe I am. It's about the... Uh, uh, armor of God. We're going to look at, look at it a little different today than maybe you've looked at it before. But uh, starting at verse 10, it says this in, ver- in Ephesians 6, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For you, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have all and having done all to stand. And then the next next opening of the next verse says, stand therefore. Our responsibility is to stand what God's given us to, to, to stand in. He is, you know, that, that stand and that's just to behave uh, a to behave in a brave, proud, unyielding manner without retreating from confrontation, danger, or adversity. In other words, when you get ready to stand, you, you're there. Nobody, nothing's going to move you. You're not going to move at all. God's got a plan for your life. And so you stand in that plan. Um, we, we're, finishing off, well, I'm thinking of, we're finishing it off our counseling class uh, at the end of January. February 13th, we start a class. We're only going to have one class in February also. And it's on discovering your God-given gifts. Uh, Pastor Vicki and I are going to alternate teaching each week. It's a powerful book about your giftedness and getting to understand your giftedness. Um, as we enter into this new year, I've said this before, we need to evaluate how we walked in the past, how we stood in the things of God before. What have we done before that's gotten us to this point? What have we done before that maybe, like Debbie said a minute ago, that maybe felt like you were in the darkness for a moment or whatever, what had happened along the way? How, do we view the, how we view the world around us is vital. We have to see them through the eyes of Christ. We have to see them as he sees them. You know, uh, we don't see... Uh, um, did we see those that didn't know Christ as wicked sinners and just throw them, cast them off the side? Or do we see them as he saw them as in the giftedness that he created in them, God created in them? In verse 10, it says, going back to verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, that statement right there says a lot, doesn't it? We're not standing on our own. We're not doing it on our own. We're not, be, we're not by ourselves. It's in the power of God's might within us. Um, today, as we enter into the new century, uh, the, you know, 
we, today, we are like the, new, the first century. Uh, it's going to take, take being strong. Think about the disciples. Think about the, the early church in the first century of God. They had to make decisions that sometimes cost them their lives. I'm not saying it's going to cost us our lives today. But what if it did come to that? Are we strong enough to stand? Are we strong enough to lay down our life for him? Now, I remember back when we first got saved, um, the, the trilogy was out there. Was, uh, Vince, help me with these, these titles. But Thief of the Night, Distant Thunder, Distant Thunder the third. Remember, Vince? Prodigal Planet. Planet, okay. But the first two, Thief of the Night was about the rapture. And all of a sudden, people are gone. But the second one is when those that had been left behind, for whatever reason, uh, but, but said they loved the Lord, they, they had to make a decision. We're not going to have to worry right now, I don't believe, for us to take, well, we're going to take the mark of the beast. Now, if we're here after the rapture, yeah, maybe we're going to have to. That's what that was all about. They had to decide to make a stand what they believed or what they didn't believe. Did they really trust God enough to get them through that time period? Do they really trust God enough to say, I'm going to stand for him no matter what happens to me, I'm going to, have, I'm, I'm going to take care of it. It's so, you know, you look back at World War II and the Nazis, as they, as they came and, and as, as Hitler pushed against the Jews, and the Jews had to make a stand. They, had to, they, they, they knew what was ahead. After they got into the concentration camps, they weren't being fed. They're down to skin and bones, and they're just standing there, believing God's going to take care of them. God's got, them, got their back. This life here, I'm not anywhere near my notes on this life here is temporary. It was never, and since, since the fall of man, since the fall, since sin entered the world, it became more temporary. Man had to learn how to die because we weren't supposed to die. Think about who was Methuselah? How many years did he live? See, think about 969 years. And he still looked good. I mean, most of them here can't live you know, 70 years and look good. Rob Folk can't. He looks good. He looks, he's 75, 80 years old now. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he robbed the cradle because Kim's only 35. <laughs> but, but the thing, think about it. We had to learn how to die, you know? You know, we're coming in at a time in the States that we've never had before. The United States has never experienced the attack on Christianity like this ever. The country was founded as a Christian nation. Look at the documents. Look at the history. Of course, they're trying to erase all the history now. But if you look at we were founded, but this right now we're at a time in, in America we've never had before. Well, since we've turned from those, since we, if we turn to those founding words, we see where God was at work in America from day one. Um, it will take us, you and I, realizing that our time in this time as Christians was ordained of God. You and I were picked to be at this time and place. You and I, God destined us for this. And we have to prepare ourselves for the battle. I heard, uh, I think it was Kim say a minute ago, it was war, something about war. Some of us said, let's war, we're at war. There have been so many strong teachers come along in, our, my, in my lifetime as a, as a believer. Uh, and, and they're starting to leave earth now. Jack Hayford recently. Pastor Callahan. Pastor Bruce Dunn was a dynamic teacher of the word. And, and so I don't necessarily agree with some of the doctrine of some of them. But, but, they, but, but they, they're powerful men and women of God. You know, Bobby Jean Merck, Elaine Homer, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, et cetera, et cetera. We can name, huh? Who? Oh, yeah, but I'm talking about it being men. I'm not talking about him being gone. Sorry. He wasn't gone. He wasn't gone. I just tagged him on at the end because he's still here. We're going to go see him this week. So I'm hoping he stayed around for a while because I'm taking a trip to Texas just to be there. No, the thing is, is that, is that these men and women of God that God's placed in our ability to learn from, now it's our turn. For those that have gone on, the words that ring in our ears that they taught us, I, I, I guess I could put Pastor Jim at the end of the skin, but uh, that, I'm sorry, I should have said that. Huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I'm saying that those men and women, God, that have been put before us as leaders, 
Not, not just the dead ones, no. Well, I'm confused too now. You got me confused. I thought it had all laid out good, and then you tell me Kenneth Copeland should be there. But I was talking about men and women of God that are great men and women of God. Some of them have gone on before us, and some are still here. Well, we have to take what they've taught us and live it out, because they, what they taught us was the Word, right? And maybe other pastors you've sat under. I know there's other ones in the, that Deb and I have been a Paul Martin, who was a dynamic man of God, that was the district superintendent for the Assemblies of God. I mean, he was a great man of God. You know, there's so many others. What you listen to on the radio, the, Rick Renner, those guys, those people are important to, for us to, to, to learn from. Ephesians, in the verse 12 of Ephesians 6 says this, For we, not, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. It's not the government we're having a battle with. It seems like it. But that's not what the deal is. It's not one political party or the other that's got the answer. It's not one president or the other that's going to lead us correctly. Why? Because they all are men and women of the world. They have an agenda. You know, I think about these people sometimes that are high up in power. And if they don't know Christ, there's a reckoning coming. And they're going to see something they've never seen before in a very short time. When we walk with God, beloved, we step into eternity with amazement. I remember seeing Pastor Collins face as Debbie's ministering to him, doing CPR on him. That brilliant smile that was on his face. I'd never seen him smile, a toothy smile, ever. And I known him, have known him a long time. The thing is, is that he saw God. He saw heaven. And he saw something that made him rejoice, even as he was leaving this earth. You know, death is not what we rack it up to be. It's, it's entering into where we're supposed to be with the kingdom of God. I look forward to the day that I'm... It's just like Joe. Joe was ready to go. When you're ready to go, God will put it in your heart. It's time to leave. We miss them. The thing is, is they're, they're where they wanted to be. It's not, so, so although... Like, Although as a Christian, I don't have a I, I have a problem with a party that uh, adheres to total abortion, and I I have a problem with with people that follow that kind of teaching and say they're Christians because there's no way you can be that way. You know, if 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 we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this age, against the spiritual hosts of witnesses in heavenly places. We as believers have to first be aware that it's a spiritual battle. The battle is not with the government. The battle is a spiritual battle. That's where we're at. That's what's going on. It's not a fleshly one. Second, there are powers at work, spiritual powers at work, wicked powers that one are trying to disrupt God's plan for man. That's the enemy's whole Keys. He wanted to, he wants to mess, he wanted to mess up the garden. He wanted to mess up Adam and Eve. He wants to continue to do it. He's he's worked it two over two thousand years. He's worked at it. He's worked at it. However many years they say we've been around, we don't know. But for the last two thousand years, he's been coming at the body of Christ strong. There was a song in the seventies, late seventies or early eighties, by Chuck Gerard. It's called "Don't Shoot the Wounded." And it's a song that every once in a while I just, I, I, I have like a radio in my head or a jukebox or whatever, stereo system. You can always count on Kim. That was good though. I have to, it does explain all. But I'll wake up in the morning and a song will be playing in my head. I'll be, and, not, and I haven't heard the song all the time, but this song caught my head, my ear, this week as I was working on this message. Here's, I want to just read some of the lines out. It says, don't shoot the wounded for they need us more than ever. They need our love no matter what it, what it is they've done. Sometimes we just condemn them and don't take time to hear their story. Don't shoot the wounded because someday you might be one. When we look at the world, when we look at people in the world, there are people that I've known in, my walk, in the time that I've been walking with God that are no longer in church. For whatever reason, they're not in church. 
But I can't look at them and just push them aside. I've seen Christians see people out in the world going and, and almost look down their nose at them. And you can't do that. That's not our job. He says, in, in, uh, we don't take time to hear the story. What, what's got them to that point? Why are they there? Why, are they, why have they turned away seemingly from the things of God? What's gone on to, to, to do that? It's easy to love people who are standing hard and fast, pressing on to meet the higher calling. It is easier to work with believers, isn't it? It's easier when you have a common theme with one another. It's easier. But the ones who, who might be struggling, who tend to judge, we tend to judge too harshly and refuse to try and catch them when they're falling. But we, we put people into boxes and draw hard conclusions, and when they do the things we know they shouldn't do, Sometimes we write them off as hopeless and throw them out, throw them to the dogs. Our compassion and our forgiveness seems in short supply. Our responsibility right now, beloved, at war is to get the casualties. Whenever I think about the, when I ever think about that, the wounded. There was a movie, John Wayne movie. I got another one coming up yet. So I just, I have a John Wayne movie. It's called The Horse Soldiers. Anybody ever see it? It's about Civil War. It's a great movie. I love John Wayne anyway. He's he's a true American. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but the thing is, in this movie, he plays this colonel, and they're on a seek and destroy mission, and uh, I can't think of the guy's name, that played the doctor that was assigned to him, a surgeon, and they had, a, they had wounded, and John Wayne had to get out of there. He said, we'll just leave the wounded, and the doctor said, well, I'm not leaving the wounded. We you going to leave him to the clemency of the enemy? What's the enemy going to do to him? And if you saw the movie Patriot... You would see what the enemy at times would do to the, to the wounded. Came in and shot them all. Well, the thing is, is that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants us to leave the wounded out for him to come up and clean it up. They say, that, well, that Christian didn't help you. You're in battle, but look, you got wounded. You're, you're, you're injured here for whatever reason, and they just walked on by you and left you here for me to take care of. With a smile on his face that he says. See, we have to be careful, beloved, that when we're out there, when we're, this year, we have to be careful of how we see people. We have to look at, there are true enemies out there of the, of, the, of, of the cause, if you want to say it like that. There are true enemies of the cause. There are truly people out there that would like to see the church fail strong. They're there. But again, I look at those people and say, well, you know what? Is, does God see them in that position or does he see them as, as he formed them in the womb? I don't believe he ever gives up hope on any person. To the very last breath, he believes somebody will come. And that's the story of the people paid, the, the first ones paid that came for the full day, the middle day, and the end day. Because the end day gets the same payment as the ones that came at the beginning of the day. I believe God never lets up hope on anybody. So we shouldn't either. Stand therefore, having girded up our waist with truth, what the word says. We love the word. We know the word. We teach the word. Now it's time to really live the word to its fullest, living it to its fullest, saying, look, I'm going to gird myself up, and I know that I can stand where I need to stand because God's with me. That's what the word said earlier. He's standing with me. If I know he's with me, I can get through anything and go through anything. You know, and I think that's what carried me through a couple of times in the past few years is I knew God was there. I wasn't anxious. I wasn't stressed. And, and I, I think, think I was the only one, one not stressed, stressed in Alabama, Alabama that time. I mean, because Debbie, Debbie was like, she's, she's going to beat up doctors. Don't, Don't believe me? Ask, ask my daughter. daughter. Debbie, <laughs> Debbie was after that doctor. <laughs> Having put on the breastplate of righteousness and understand that continuing to learn the righteousness of the Lord is given to us. We have to continue to learn what we're in. We have to continue to, to, to realize what we've been given. Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 says this. And this I pray... That, that your love, love may abound still, still more and more in knowledge, knowledge and discernment. That, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Christ. Don't, get, don't, don't take, take offense. It doesn't, doesn't matter what person somebody, somebody calls you. you. Debbie got called by a, a, a Christian doctor years, years ago working at Prompt Care. He said, I'm tired of the Pollyanna attitude here. He was focusing on Debbie. Because she, she always tried to come across this, some nice, there's something, nice, there's something we, we look at this differently, we don't have to be stressed. And he just, the, the, the enemy in him rose up to attack Debbie. Don't get offended when somebody says something to you. Because offense only hurts you. 
Number 11, verse 11 says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Be filled with righteousness. Be filled with the fruits of it. It should be blossoming out of us. And when it does, then we won't get offended. We won't get hurt. We won't get damaged. Having your feet shod with Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. John 14, 27 says this, Peace I leave you. Jesus speaking now. Peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It doesn't matter what comes at you. If you're walking in the peace of God, there's nothing the enemy can throw at you. I believe Rob Westbrook's walking in the peace of God for about five years now. At, At least, least five years. <laughs> I'm in right, right now. I mean, what he's gone through. I, I wasn't saying. I wasn't saying he wasn't in peace before. Why you guys always got? Why you always got to twist my words? Anyway, I, I believe, but I look at him. When I look at him, I see the peace of God. When I look at him, I see the peace of God just encompassing him to its fullest. That's why he doesn't get trouble. That's why he's not afraid. It's because the peace of God is so strong. Romans 3.17 says this, and the way of peace they have not known. Not that's, that's the people that don't know God. They do a way of peace they don't know. If, if you can get people to understand the peace of God, there's no way you want to turn away from that. There's no way you don't want to live there. I want to live there. I want to work on it all the time. And it's tough sometimes, Debbie. It's tough. I'm telling you. And it's going to get tougher today. <laughs> uh, uh, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield is important because we walk by faith. Faith is our essence. It's, we walk by faith, we talk faith, we believe faith. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5 through 8, it says this Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing of God, who has also given us a spirit as a guarantee. So, so we, we are, are always confident, confident knowing that, that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Nothing on our horizon should be so threatening that it takes away our faith. You know, I believe that's where Job was. I believe he walked that whole process through faith. I believe that's where Dave gives it is in faith. Now, you can, we can always draw the conclusions, but I believe that those men are in faith. I believe that Rob Westbrook has walked in faith all this time. I believe that I walk by faith every day simply because I feel something going on in my chest. I think God's just got his hand in there again working. I mean, he redeveloped my heart before. But you got to walk, you got to trust that. You can't get anxious about things. You can't get offended by things. We have to learn to walk by our faith. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, for which is, which is the Lord. Debbie made the same as I was talking about this earlier. You know, uh, we carry the sword of God with us wherever we go. Now, some of you have it on your phone. Checking out phones. Oh, you, oh, you got, got it up there. there. Okay. okay. You, know what's, you, know what's, you know what the only bad part about modern living is? Back when we first got saved, we also supposed to be saved. You took your Bible to church. And now, how many of us actually carry our Bibles in? Anyway, I'm going to read your Bible. So you have to carry it for him? I. <laughs> I, I, uh, I have caught myself recently, and I've got Bibles everywhere. I mean, I, I buy old Bibles. I've got Bibles everywhere. I got, got they're in my cars. They're, but I've watched myself recently. Like I go to study, and I don't take my Bible with me because it's on my iPad. So it's like I, you guys have broke me down. I'm, 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 I'm switched. The thing is, is that the Word of God is with us all the time. And we, we carry, carry that sword with us. So we go into battle. We're not by ourselves. Again, we're not standing alone. You know, there's, there's a here. I'm going to go to the movie. There's a movie a series, a series of three movies back in the 70s. It was an, a, a true account of a life in Tennessee. 
Uh, my, my dad, dad loved, loved this three movies, mainly because we used to drive through that county. We would go to Alabama, and he'd drive through it. And so he just loved it. So I, I bought him the movies, things like that. And um, as I was preparing, preparing for this special, I decided to watch the first movie the other night. Um, now, it was a series of truly worldly good versus worldly evil. That's the whole essence of the movie. But after I watched it, I realized that there was more to it than worldly good versus worldly evil. Um, it took one man in this movie, in this, in this true life account, took one man to stand against evil. It took one man to ignite a revival against evil that started, had started coming into the county that he grew up in. The county, the county people, people had already surrendered. surrendered. They had sort of surrendered to it. But this one man stood. He stepped up and said, enough's enough. One man stood up and walked tall. One man. Because all it takes is one of us to stand. And all it takes is one of us to stand up for the things of God in this time we're living in. Only one of us. Think what will happen when all of us stand together. See, God doesn't lose. He doesn't, he doesn't lose anything. anything. He, he has, has us and he has, has a plan for your errors in my life. Now, I'm not sure, you know, as, as we enter this new year, year we, have to, to, we have to sharpen, sharpen old tools. tools. What we, we did this morning was sharpening some old tools. tools. But we, we also, also have to get into the toolbox, tool as it were, and find new ones that we can use. You know, I tell people all the time in counseling, one of the things that I tell them, I say, you know, you've got a lot of tools you're missing. In, in, in what you're, what you're trying, trying to save your marriage, marriage trying to save this, or get out of depression. You got you to get in and reach into the toolbox and say, oh, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this. And when you start working the tools, you'll work through the issues of life. And the thing is, is we have to get our old tools sharpened to use that we're trusting before. But we also have to add to them out of the toolbox that God has given us also. We have, we have to be ready to, it's going to be a powerful year to be alive for Jesus Christ this year. As, as I, 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 I would, would her in a suit. <laughs> about every name going through my head, but you're a suit. She, she said, said what Mark Barkley said to her is, you've been walking as knee-deep mud. Now, I, I detasseled when I was a teenager. And whenever it detasseled, it always rains. I don't care. So they're going to detassel, it's going to rain. And you get out there, and it's, it's, it's muddy, and you, have to walk. you can't use the machines, and you've got to walk through the fields. We had a guy that stood about this tall. Smallest, smallest guy in our group, the skinniest guy in our group. We're, we're walking through, and he got stuck in the mud. It took four of us to pull him out of the mud. <laughs> the thing the is, is, is that we may, be, like she said, he, God, God said, said to her, her, I mean, Brother Mark, uh, Mark Barkley said to her, you've, you've been walking and needing mud. You may feel that way, too. You may feel like that's what you've been going through. The thing is, beloved, the hard ground is coming. The field only got really soggy in the middle. Pretty soon you'd walk out of the mud, and you'd be back on hard ground. Or be level ground, firm ground at least. We have to realize that when we do this this year, we're going to walk onto hard ground. And then we're going to walk onto why? Because we're staying steadfast to the things of God and we're going to start seeing things happen like we had today. You know, today we had church long before I got to preach. We had church. We could have stopped right there and said we had church today. Because the Bible talks about when, we have, when you have churches, everybody come together with their giftedness in orderly fashion and, and presenting, presenting it. it. That's, That's what we, we had, had today. That's, That's what we're going to start happening. We switched the worship because we wanted that flow early. early. Which We're making changes. changes. We, we want to make changes. changes. Why? Because, because we want to be. Uh, uh, we want to stay even, at least, with the Holy Spirit's movement in this place. God has gifted every one of us in this place with a certain gift that's specific to you, specific to me. You know, as a as a as a I know I'm a teacher. I understand that. That's my gift. I'm a counselor. That's my gift. I also know as a pastor what pastoring means. And pastoring doesn't necessarily mean preaching. A lot of people preach. You're all called to preach. But you're not all called to pastor. There's a difference. You know, God doesn't lose because he doesn't lose when we stand our ground. When we stand with him and move forward. When we speak the name of Jesus... Over every heart and every life, things have to change. When you're out in the streets this week, well, I don't mean out in the streets, but you're out living life. 
You're not living life. If you see something that catches your eye, just simply speak Jesus. If you get into something, all of a sudden you get, you get this rush of fear or something rises up, you, you speak Jesus. You get up tomorrow morning and you don't feel good, you speak Jesus. When, like Debbie says, that, that, is, that is getting a, our attention, that song has got a hold of her, and it's getting a hold of us. Why? Because we know the power in the name of Jesus. We need to speak life to all that's out there. We need to speak life to our families. Is that part of that, one of the songs early in the war? You can't have my family. I'm seeing changes in our family, our, our extended family, that I've been, Deb and I have been believing for for years. My mom has been believing for certain things within the family structure for years now. And, and, and if you talk to her, she's not going until Jesus comes back anyway, so there's still a whole lot of time to work. But guess what, beloved? When you're praying for your family, Joe's prayers didn't leave with him. They're still working. They're still working in lives. You know, my dad's prayers didn't end with him leaving this earth. They're still working. I believe with all my heart that I got saved because I had two grandmas who prayed for me and believed in me. And, they, and they, they, those prayers were laid out to, to Jesus Christ for me. And they didn't quit working just because they left long before I came to the Lord. We need to speak Jesus. We need to stand and cry out the name Jesus. No matter what. No matter where. Amen? Amen. We love you guys. If you, have, if you have a need, don't leave this place in need. Never. Always say, I want, to, I want you to pray for us. We want to pray. We want to believe. Deb and I are going to miss you. We're going down to get filled up. Come back here for another conference to get filled up again. It's going to be a powerful end of the January for, for everybody concerned. Watershed, please be there as many times as you can. You will not walk away reluctant or regretting or sorry. Or you walk away power. Because you've got some powerful preachers that week. Match them up against all the Copeland people. That's how good they are. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you in two.